Um, all right, everyone, uh, let's get started with the next lecture. So today we're going to th tackle the topic of metaprogramming. And this title is a little weird. It's not entirely clear what we mean by metaprogramming. But we couldn't really come up with a better name for this lecture. Because this lecture is about the processes that surround the work that you do when working with software. It is not about programming itself necessarily, but about the process. Um, this can be things like how your sy system is built, how it's tested, uh, how you add dependencies to your software, that sort of stuff that becomes really relevant when you build larger pieces of software, but they're not really programming in and of themselves. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about uh, in this lecture is the notion of build systems. Um, so how many of you have used a build system before or know what it is? Okay, so about half of you. Um, so th for the rest of you, the, the central idea behind a build system is that um, you're writing a paper, you're writing software, you're like working on a class, whatever it might be, and you have a bunch of commands that you've like either written down in your shell history or you, you wrote them down in a document somewhere that you know you have to run if you want to do a particular thing. So for example, like there are a sequence of commands that you need to run in order to build your paper or build your thesis or just to run the tests for whatever class you're currently in. And a build system, uh, the sort of idea is that you want to encode these rules for what commands to run in order to build particular targets into a tool that can do it for you. Uh, and in particular, you're going to teach this tool about the dependencies between those different artifacts that you might build. Um, there are a lot of different types of tools of this kind, uh, and many of them are built for particular purposes, particular languages. Some of them are built for um, building like papers. Some of them are built for building software. Some of them are built for particular programming languages like Java, um, or some some tools even have built-in tools for for build. So uh, npm, for example, you might be aware if you've done Node.js development, has a bunch of built-in tools for doing uh, tracking of dependencies and building them and building all of the dependent stuff of your software. But more generally, these are known as build systems. And at their core, they all function uh, in a very similar way. And that is you have a number of targets. These are the things that you want to build. These are things like paper.pdf. Um, but they can also be more abstract things like run the test suite or build the binary for this program. Then you have a bunch of dependencies. And dependencies are things that need to be built in order for this thing to be built. And then you have rules that define how do you go from a complete list of dependencies to the given target. So an example of this might be in order to build my paper.pdf, I need a bunch of like plot images that are going to go into the paper. So they need to be built. But then once they have been built, how do I construct the paper given those files? So that is what a rule is. It's a sequence of commands that you run to get from one to the other. Um, how you encode these rules differs between different tools. Uh, in this particular class, we're going to focus on a tool called Make. Uh, Make is a, a tool that you will find on almost any system that you log in today. Like, it'll be on Mac OS, it'll be on basically every Linux and BSD system, uh, and you can pretty easily get it on Windows. Um, it's not great for very complex software, but it works really well for anything that's sort of simple to medium uh, complexity. Um, now, when you run make, make is just a command you can run on the command line. And when you type make, in, this is an empty directory. Um, if I type make, it just says no target specified and no make file found, stop. And so it helpfully tells you that it stopped running, um, but also it tells you that no make file was found. Um, make will look for a file literally called make file in the current directory. And that is where you encode these targets, dependencies, and rules. Um, so let's try to write one. Um, let's imagine that I'm writing this hypothetical paper, uh, and so I'm going to make a make file. Uh, and in this make file, I'm going to say that my paper.pdf depends on, that's what the colon here indicates, uh, paper.txt, so this is going to be a, a LaTeX file, um, and plotdata.png. Um, and the command in order to build this is going to be PDF latex of paper.txt. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with this particular way of building documents, uh, LaTeX is a really handy programming language for documents. 
Uh, it's a really ugly language, and it's a pain to work with, but it produces pretty nice documents. Um, and the tool you use to go from a tech file to PDF is PDF LaTeX. Um, and here I'm saying that I also depend on this plot, uh, plot data PNG that's going to be included in my document. And what I'm really saying here is if either of those two dependencies change, I want you to build paper PDF. They both need to be present, and should they ever change, I want you to rebuild it. Um, but I haven't really told it how to generate this plot data PNG, uh, so I might want to rule for that as well. Um, so I'm going to define another target here, and it's going to be, it's going to look like this. Um, plot dash percent, and per, what percent means in make is any string. It's sort of a wildcard pattern. Um, but the cool thing is that you can repeat this pattern in the dependencies. So I can say that plot dash percent dot png is going to depend on uh, percent dot data or dat. Um, that is a common sort of suffix for data files. Um, and it's also going to depend on some script that's going to actually plot this for me. And the rules for, to go from one to the other, uh, these can be multiple lines, but in my particular case, they're just one line. Um, I'm going to explain what this is in a little second. Uh, all right, so here we're going to say that in order to go from a wildcard.dat file that matches the wildcard in the target um, and a plot.python file, uh, run the Python file with dash i, which is going to be like the way we mark what the input is in our Python file. I'll show it to you later. Dollar star is a special variable that is defined for you in makefile rules uh, that matches whatever the percentile was. So if I do plot dash foo.png, then it's going to look for foo.dat, and it dollar star is going to expand to foo. So this will produce the same file name as the one we matched here. And dollar at is a special variable that means the name of the target. Right, so the output file. And hopefully what plot.py will do is that it will take whatever the data is here, it will produce a PNG somehow, and it will write it into the file indicated by the dollar at. Right? Um, so now we have a make file. Let's see what happens if the only file in this directory is the make file and we run make. Well, it says no rule to make target paper.txt needed by paper.pdf. Stop. Um, so what it's saying here is, uh, first of all, it looked at the first rule of our file, the first target, and when you give make no arguments, it tries to build whatever the first target is. This is known as the default goal. So in this case, it tried to helpfully build paper.pdf for us, and then it looked at the dependencies, and it said, well, in order to build paper.pdf, I need paper.txt, and I need this PNG file, and I can't find paper.txt, and I don't have a rule for generating paper.txt, therefore I'm going to exit. There's nothing more I can do. Um, so let's try to make some files here. Let's just make like an empty paper.txt uh, and then type make. So now it says no rule to make target plot data.png needed by paper.pdf. Right? So now it's, it knows that it has one dependency, but it doesn't know how to get the other one. It knows that there's a target that matches, but it can't actually find its dependencies, and so it ends up doing nothing at all. Uh, it still still needs us to generate this PNG for, for or the input for the PNG. So let's actually put some useful stuff into these files. Um, let's say that luckily I have one from earlier. Uh, Plot.py to here. So let's look at what this text file is. This is what text looks like. It's not very pretty, but basically I'm defining an empty document. I'm going to include graphics, which is the way you include a uh, an image file. I'm going to include plot data.png, and this is, of course, why we want a dependency of paper.pdf to be the PNG file. Um, Plot.py is also not very interesting. It just imports a bunch of libraries. It parses the dash i and dash o arguments. It loads data from the dash i argument. It uses um, a library called matplotlib, which is very handy for just quickly uh, plotting data, and it's just going to plot the first column of the data as x's, and the second column of the data as y's. So we're just going to have a data file that's two columns, x and y, on every line. And then it saves that as a figure into whatever the given um, dash o value is. Uh, OK, so we need a data file. Um, it's going to be data.dat. 
because we want plot dash data.png, and our rules said that the way you go from that pattern to the dot file, the dot dat file, is just by whatever follows plot. So if we want plot dash data, then we want data dot dat. And then this file, we're just going to put in some linear coordinates, because why not? That's not linear. All right. And now what happens if we run make? Well, ooh. OK, so what just happened? Well, make um, first ran plot.py with the correct files to generate the, the PNG file. And then it ran PDF LaTeX paper.txt. And all the stuff we see below is just the output from that tool. So if we wanted to, we could silence the output from this tool so we don't have to like have it mess with all our output. But in general, you notice that it ran the two commands, and then it ran them, perhaps unsurprisingly, in the right order. And if we now do ls in the current directory, we see that we have a bunch of files that were generated by PDF uh, LaTeX. Um, but in particular, we have the PNG file, which was generated, and we have the paper.pdf. And if we open the paper.pdf file, we see that it has one image which has a straight line. Perhaps in and of itself, a not a very surprising or interesting result. Um, but where this gets really handy is I can do things like if I type make again, make just says paper.pdf is up to date. It does no work. Whenever you run make, it tries to do the minimal amount of work in order to produce whatever you ask it to produce. In this case, none of the dependencies have changed. So there's no reason to rebuild the paper or to rebuild the plot. If I now, let's say, uh, I'm going to edit paper.txt, and I'm going to add hello here. And now I run make. Then if we scroll up, we'll see it didn't run plot.py again, because it didn't need to. None of the dependencies changed. But it did run PDF LaTeX again. And indeed, if we open the paper, it now says hello over there. Um, on the other hand, if I were to change, say, the data file and make this point 8, and now run make, then now it plots again, because the data changed. Uh, and it regenerates the PDF because the plot changed. And indeed, the paper turns out the way we expected it to. So that's not to say that this particular pipeline is very interesting, um, because it's not. It's only two very straightforward um, targets and rules. But this can come in really handy when you start building larger pieces of software, where there might be dependencies. You might even imagine that if you're writing a paper, uh, one of your targets might be producing this data file in the first place. right? So one of the makefile targets might be run my experiment, right? run my benchmark, and stick the, the data points that come out into this file, and then plot the results, and then, and then, and then, and then, all the way until you end up with the final paper. Um, and what's nice about this is, first of all, you don't have to remember all the commands to run. You don't have to write them down anywhere. But also, the tool takes care of doing the minimal amount of work needed. Often you'll find things like there'll be, there'll be subcommands to make, like make test, right? which is going to compile your entire piece of software and also uh, run the tests. Um, there might be things like make release, which builds it with optimizations turned on and creates a tarball and uploads that somewhere. right? So it's going to do the whole pipeline for you. The idea is to reduce the effort that you have to do as any part of your build process. Um, now, what we saw here was a, a very straightforward example of dependencies. right? So we saw here that you could declare files as dependencies, but you could also declare sort of transitive dependencies. right? I depend on this thing, which is generated by this other target. Very often, when you work with dependencies in the, in the larger area of software, um, you'll find that your, your system ends up having many different types of dependencies. Some of these are files, like we saw here. Uh, some of them are programs, right? Like uh, this sort of implicitly depends on Python being installed on my machine. Some of it might be libraries, right? You might depend on something like uh, matplotlib, which we depend on here. Uh, some of them might be system libraries, like OpenSSL or OpenSSH, um, or like low-level crypto libraries. Um, and you don't necessarily declare all of them. Very often, there's sort of an, an assumption about what is installed on the given system. What you'll find is that for most places where you have dependencies, there are tools for managing those dependencies for you. And very often, these systems you might depend on are stored in what are known as repositories. So a repository is just a collection of things 
usually related that you can install. That's basically all a repository is. And you might be familiar with some of them already, right? So some examples of repositories are PyPy, which is a well-known repository for Python packages, uh, RubyGems, which is similar for Ruby, uh, crates.io for Rust, uh, NPM for Node.js, but other things are repositories too, right? Like there are repositories for cryptographic keys, uh, like Keybase. There are repositories for uh, system installed packages. Like if you've ever used the apt tool in Ubuntu or in Debian, you are interacting with a package repository where people who have written like programs and libraries upload them so that you can then install them. Similarly, um, you might have repositories that are entirely open. Right, so the Ubuntu repositories, for example, are usually provided by the Ubuntu developers, but in Arch Linux, there, might, there is something called the Arch user repository, where users can just share their own, um, their own libraries and their own packages themselves. And very often, repositories are either sort of managed or they are just entirely open. And you should often be aware of this, because if you're using an entirely open repository, maybe the security guarantees you get from that are less than what you get in a controlled repository. One thing you'll notice if you start using repositories is that very often software is versioned. Um, and what I mean by versioned, well, you might have seen this for stuff like browsers, right, where there might be something like uh, starting like Chrome version 64.0.201903.24, right? This is a version number. It might, there's a dot here. Um, this is one kind of version number. But sometimes if you start, um, I don't know, like uh, Photoshop or you start any other tool, there might be other kind of versions that are like 8.1.7, right? And these version numbers are usually numerical, but not always. Sometimes they have hashes in them, for example, to refer to git commits. But you might wonder, why do we have these? Why is it even important that you add a number to software that you release? The primary reason for this is because it enables me to um, know whether my software will break. Imagine that I have a dependency on a library that Jose has written, right? And Jose is constantly doing changes to his library because he wants to make it better. And he decides that one of the functions that his library exposes has a bad name, so he renames it my software suddenly stops working, right? Because I, my library calls a function on Jose's library, but that function no longer exists, depending on which version people have installed of Jose's library. Versions help solve this, because I can say I depend on this version of Jose's library, and then there has to be some rules around what is Jose allowed to do within a given version. If he makes a change that I can no longer rely on, his version has to change in some way. Um, there are many thoughts on exactly how this should work. Um, like, what are the rules for publishing new versions? How do they change the version numbers? Um, some of them are just dictated by time. So, for example, if you look at browsers, they very often have time, um, versions that look like this. They have a, a version number on the far left that's just like, which release? And then they have sort of an incremental number that is usually zero. Um, and then they have a date at the end. Right, so this is uh, March 24th, 2019, for some reason. Um, and usually that will indicate that this is version 64 of Firefox uh, from this date. And then if they release sort of patches or hotfixes for security bugs, they might increment the date, but keep the version at the, at the left the same. Um, and people have strong, strong opinions on exactly what the scheme should be, and you sort of depend on knowing what schemes other people use, right? If I don't know what scheme Jose is using for changing his versions, maybe I just have to say, you have to run like 817 of, of Jose's software, otherwise I cannot build my software. But this is a problem too, right? Imagine that Jose is a responsible developer of his library, and he finds a security bug, and he fixes it. But it doesn't change the external interface to his library. No functions change, no types change. Then I want people to be building my software with his new version. And it just so happens that building mine works just fine with his new version because that particular version didn't change anything I depended on. So one attempted solution to this is something called semantic versioning. 
So in semantic versioning, we give each of the numbers separated by dots in a version number a particular meaning. And we give a, a contract for when you have to increment the different numbers. In particular, in semantic versioning, we call this the major version. We call this the minor version. And we call this the patch version. And the rules around this are as follows. If you make a change to whatever your software is, and, and the change you made is entirely backwards compatible, right? like it does not add anything, it does not remove anything, it does not rename anything, externally it is as if nothing changed, then you only increment the patch number, nothing else. So usually security fixes, for example, will increment the patch number. If you add something to your library, I'm just going to call them libraries because usually libraries are the things where this matters. Um, so for a library, if you add something to the library, you increment the minor version and you set the patch to zero. So in this case, if we were to do a minor release, the next minor release version number would be 820. And the reason we do this is because I might have a dependency on a feature that Jose added in 8.2.0, which means you can't build my software with 8.1.7. That would not be okay, even though if, you, if I had written it towards 8.1.7, you could run it with 8.2.0. The reverse is not true, because it might not have been added yet. And then finally, the major version, you increment if you make a backwards incompatible change, where if my software used to work with whatever version you had, and then you make a change that means that my software might no longer work, such as removing a function or renaming it, then you increment the major version and set minor and patch to zero. So the next major version here would be 9.0.0. Taken together, these allow us to do really nice things when setting what our dependencies are. In particular, if I depend on a particular version of someone's library, Rather than saying it has to be exactly this version, what I'm really saying is it has to be the same major version and at least the same minor version, and the patch can be whatever. This means that if I have a dependency on Jose software, then any later release that is still within the same major is fine. That includes, keep in mind, an earlier version, assuming that the minor is the same. Imagine that you are on some older computer that has like version 8.1.3. In theory, my software should work just fine with 8.1.3 as well. It might have whatever bug Jose fixed in between, like whatever security issue. But this has the nice property that now you can share dependencies between many different pieces of software in your machine. If you have version 8.3.0 installed, and there are a bunch of different software that like one requires 817, one requires 824, one requires 801. All of them can use the same version of that dependency, so you only need it installed once. Um, one of the most common, or one of the most familiar perhaps examples of this kind of semantic versioning is if you look at the Python versioning. So many of you may have come across this where Python 3 and Python 2 are not compatible with one another. They're not backwards compatible. If you write code in Python 2 and you try to run it in Python 3, it might not work. There are some cases where it will, but that is more accidental than anything else. And Python actually follows semantic versioning, at least mostly. Um, and so if you write software that runs on Python 3.5, then it should also work in 3.6, 3.7, 3.8. It will not necessarily work in Python 4, although that will hopefully be a long time away. But if you write code for Python 3.5, it will, it will possibly not run on Python 3.4. So one thing you will see many software projects do is they try to bring the version requirements they have as low as possible. If you can depend on major and then minor and patch 0.0, that is the best possible dependency you can have, because it is completely liberal as to which version of that major you're depending on. Sometimes this is hard, right? Sometimes you genuinely need a feature that was added, but the lower you can get, the better it is for those who want to depend on your software in turn. <clears throat> 
Um, when working with these sort of dependency management systems or in, with versioning in general, you'll often come across this notion of lock files. Uh, you might have seen this where like, you try to do something and it says like, cannot reconcile versions or you get an error like lock file already exists. These are often somewhat different topics, but in general the notion of a lock file is to make sure that you don't accidentally update something. The lock file at its core is really just a list of your dependencies and which version of them you are currently using. Right? So my version string might be 8.1.7 and the latest version like on the internet somewhere might be 8.3.0. But the, whatever is installed on my system is not necessarily one of those two. It might be like 8.2.4 or something like that. And the lock file will then say dependency Jose version 8.2.4. And the reason you want a lock file, th there can be many. Um, one of them is that you might want your builds to be fast. If every single time you tried to build your project, whatever tool you were using downloaded the latest version and then compiled it and then compiled your thing, you might wait for a really long time each time, depending on the release cycle of your dependencies. If you use a lock file, then Unless the version, unless you've updated the version in your lock file, it'll just use whatever it built previously for that dependency, and your sort of development cycle can be a lot faster. Another reason to use lock files is to get reproducible builds. Imagine that I produce some kind of security-related software, and I very carefully audited my dependencies. And I produce like a signed binary of like, here is the, a, like a sworn statement for me that this version is secure. If I didn't include a lock file, then by the time someone else installs my program, they might get a later version of the dependency, and maybe that later version has like been hacked somehow, or just has some other security vulnerability that I haven't had a chance to look at yet, right? And a lock file basically allows me to freeze the ecosystem as of this version that I have checked. The extreme version of this is something called vendoring. When you vendor your dependencies, it really just means you copy pasted them. Vendoring means take whatever dependency you care about and copy it into your project. Because that way, you are entirely sure that you will get that version of that dependency. It also means that you can like, make modifications to it on your own, but it has the downsides that now you no longer get these benefits of versioning. Right? You no longer have the advantage that if there are newer releases of that software, your users might get them automatically. Like for example, when Jose fixes his security issues. Not that he has any, of course. Um, one thing you'll notice is that when talking about this, I've been talking about sort of bigger processes around your systems. These are things like um, testing, there are things like checking your dependency versions. Um, there are also things like just setting up build systems. And often, you don't just want a local build system, you want a build process that includes other types of systems, or you want them to run even when your computer is not necessarily on. And this is why, as you start working on larger and larger projects, you will see people use this idea of continuous integration. And continuous integration systems are essentially a cloud build system. The idea is that you have your project stored on the internet somewhere, and you have set it up with some kind of service that is running an ongoing thing for your project, whatever it might be. And continuous integration can be all sorts of stuff. It can be stuff like releasing your library to PyPy automatically whenever you push to a particular branch. Um, it could be things like run your test suite whenever someone submits a pull request. Or it could be um, check your code style every time you commit. There are all sorts of things you could do with continuous integration. And the, the easiest way to think about them is that they're sort of event-triggered actions. So whenever a particular event happens for your repository, for your project, a particular action takes place, where the action is usually some kind of script, some sequence of um, programs that are going to be invoked and they're going to do something. Um, it, this is really an umbrella term that encapsulates a lot of different types of services. So some continuous integration services are very general. Things like uh, Travis CI or Azure Pipelines um, or GitHub Actions are all very broad CI platforms. 
They're built to let you write what you want to happen whenever any event that you define happens. Very broad systems. There are also more specialized systems that deal with things like um, continuous integration, coverage testing. So like annotate your code and show you have no tests that test this piece of code. And they're built only for that purpose. Or they're built only for testing um, browser-based libraries or something like that. And so often you can find CI tools that are built for the particular project you're working on, or you can use one of these broader providers. And one thing that's nice is that many of them are actually free, especially for open source software. Or if you're a student, you can often get them for free as well. Um, in general, the way you use the CI system is that you add a file to your repository, and this file is often known as a recipe. And what the recipe specifies is this sort of dependency cycle. Again, sort of what we saw with make files. It's not quite the same. The events, instead of being files, might be something like when someone pushes a commit, or when a commit contains a particular message, or um, when someone submits a pull request, or continuously, right? One example of a continuous integration service that's not tied to any particular change to your code is something called the Dependabot. Uh, you can find this on GitHub, and the Dependabot is something that you hook up to your, your repository, and it will just scan whether there are newer versions available of your dependencies that you're not using. So for example, if I was depending on 8.1.7, uh, and I had a lock file that locked it to 8.2.4, and then 8.3.0 is released, the Dependabot will go, you should update your lock file, and then submit a pull request to your repository with that update. So this is a continuous integration service that's not tied to me changing anything, but to the ecosystem at large changing. Um, often these CI systems integrate back into your project as well. So very often these CI services will provide things like little badges. So let me give an example. Um, so for example, here's a project I worked on recently that has continuous integration set up. So this project, You'll notice it's README. If I can zoom in here without Chrome being, oop. Oop, that's much larger than I wanted. Um, here, you'll see that at the top of the, the repository's page, there are a bunch of these badges. And they display various, various types of information. You'll notice that I have a Dependabot running, right? So the dependencies are currently up to date. Um, it tells me about whether the test suite is currently passing on the master branch. It tells me how much of the code is covered by tests. And it tells me uh, what is the latest version of this library and what is the latest version of the documentation of the library that's available online. And all of these are managed by various continuous, uh, continuous integration services. Another example that some of you might find useful or might even be familiar with is um, the notion of GitHub pages. So GitHub Pages is a really nice service that GitHub provides, which lets you um, set up a CI action that uh, builds your repository as a blog, essentially. It's, it runs a static site generator called Jekyll. Um, and Jekyll just takes a bunch of markdown files and then produces a complete website and then as a part of GitHub Pages, they will also upload that to GitHub servers and make it available at a particular domain. And this is actually how the class website works. Class website is not a bunch of like, HTML pages that we manage. Instead, there's a repository. Uh, missing semester. So if you look at the missing semester repository, you will see, if I zoom out a little here, um, that this just has a bunch of markdown files, right? It has, uh, let's look at 2020 uh, metaprogramming.md. So this is the, if I go to raw here, this is the raw markdown for today's lecture. So this is the way that I write the lecture notes. And then I commit that to the repository we have and I push it. And whenever a push happens, the GitHub pages CI is going to run the build script for GitHub Pages and produces the website for our class without me having to do any additional steps to make that happen. And so, yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, so, so Jekyll, it's using a tool called Jekyll, which is a uh, tool that takes um, a directory structure that contains markdown files and produces a website. It produces like HTML files. Um, and then as a part of the action, it takes those files and uploads them to GitHub servers at a particular domain. And usually that's a domain under like github.io that they control. And then I have set missing semester to point to the GitHub domain. Um, I, I want to give you one aside on testing because it's something that many of you m may be familiar with from before, right? You have a rough idea of what testing is. You've like run a test before. You've seen a test fail. You know like the basics of it. Uh, or maybe you've never seen a test fail. In which case, congratulations. Um, uh, but as you, as you get to more advanced projects, though, you'll find that people have um, a lot of terminology around testing. And testing is a pretty like, deep subject uh, that you could spend many, many hours trying to understand the ins and outs of. And I'm not going to go through it in excruciating detail, but there are a couple of words that I think it's useful to know what mean. Um, and the first of these is a test suite. So a test suite is a very straightforward name for all of the tests in a program. Uh, it's really just a suite of tests. It's a large collection of tests that usually are run as a unit. Um, and there are different types of tests that often make up a test suite. Um, the first of these is what's known as a unit test. A unit test is a often usually fairly small test, a self-contained test that tests a single feature. What exactly a feature might mean is a little bit up to the project, but the idea is that it should be sort of a micro test that only tests a very particular thing. Then you have the larger tests that are known as integration tests. Integration tests try to test the interaction between different subsystems of a program. So this might be something like, um, a, an example of a unit test might be um, if you're writing an HTML parser, to the unit test might be test that it can parse an HTML tag. An integration test might be, here's an HTML document, parse it. Right? So that is going to be the, integ the integration of multiple of the subsystems of the parser. You also have a notion of regression tests. Regression tests are tests that test things that were broken in the past. So imagine that someone submits um, some kind of issue to you and says, your library breaks if I give it a marquee tag. And that makes you sad, so you want to fix it. So you fix your parser to now support marquee tags. But then you want to add a test to your test suite that checks that you can parse marquee tags. The reason for this is so that in the future, you don't accidentally reintroduce that bug. So that is what regression tests are for. And over time, your project is going to build up more and more of these. And they're nice because they prevent your project from regressing to earlier bugs. The last one I want to mention is um, a concept called mocking. So mocking is the idea of um, being able to replace parts of your system with a sort of dummy version of itself that behaves in a way that you control. A common example of this is you're writing something that does, oh, I don't know, um, file copying over SSH. Right? This is a tool that you've written that does file copying over SSH. There are many things you might want to mock here. For example, when running your test suite, you probably don't actually care that there's a network there. right? You don't need to have to like set up TCP ports and stuff. So instead, you're going to mock the network. The way this usually works is that somewhere in your library, you have something that like opens a connection or reads from the connection or writes to the connection. And you're going to overwrite those functions internally in your library with functions that you've written just for the purposes of testing, where the read function just like returns the data, and the write function just drops the data on the floor or something like that. Similarly, you could write a mocking function for the SSH functionality. You could write something that does not actually do encryption. It doesn't talk to the network. It just like takes bytes in here, and just magically they pop out the other side. And you can ignore everything that's been tween, because for the purposes of copying a file, if you just wanted to test that functionality, the stuff below doesn't matter for that test. And so you might mock it away. 
Usually, in any given language, there are tools that let you build these kind of mocking abstractions pretty easily. Um, that is the end of what I wanted to talk about metaprogramming, but this is a very, very broad subject. Uh, things like continuous integration, build systems, there are so many out there that can let you do so many interesting things with your project. So I highly recommend that you start looking into it a little. Um, the exercises are um, sort of all over the place, and I mean that in a good way. Uh, they're intended to try to just show you the kind of possibilities that exist for build, working with these kind of processes. So for example, the last exercise um, has you write one of these continuous integration actions yourself, where it, you decide what the event be, and you decide what the action be, but try to actually build one. And this can be something that you might find useful in your project. The example I give in the exercises is try to build an action that runs like write good or proslint, one of the linters we saw for the English language, on your repository. And if you do, like we could enable that for the class repository so that our lecture notes are actually well written, right? Uh, and this is one other thing that's nice about this kind of continuous integration testing is that you can collaborate between projects. If you write one, I can use it in my project. Uh, and that's a really handy feature where you can build this ecosystem of improving everything. Any questions about any of the stuff we've covered today? Yeah? In my experience, it, often the idea of make along with CMake, and they like do different parts of building some program. Is there, do you have like a minute to talk about sure. CMake and how it plays with make? So, so the question is, uh, why do we have both make and CMake? What do they do? Uh, and is there a reason for them to talk together? Um, so, so CMake, huh, I don't actually know what the tagline for CMake is anymore, but it's sort of like a better make for C, as the name implies. Um, CMake generally um, understands the layout of C projects a little bit better than makefiles do. Uh, they're sort of built to try to parse out what the structure of your dependencies are, what the rules from going to one to the other is. Uh, it also integrates a little bit nicer with things like uh, system libraries. So CMake can do things like detect whether a given library is available on your computer or if it's available at multiple different paths. It tries to find which of those paths it's present on on this system and then link it appropriately. So CMake is a little bit smarter than Make is. Make will only do whatever you put in the make file. It's not entirely true. There are things called implicit rules that are like built-in rules in make, but they're pretty dumb. Whereas CMake tries to build a, be a larger build system that is opinionated by default to work for C projects. Similarly, there's a tool called Maven. So Maven and uh, Ant, which is another project, um, they are both built for Java projects. They understand how Java code interacts with one another, how you structure Java programs and they're built for that task. Very often, at least when I use make, I use make sort of at the top, and then make my call other tools that build whatever subsystem they know how to build, right? Like my make file might call cargo to build a Rust program, and then call CMake to build some like C dependency of that, but then at the top, like, I'm gonna do some stuff at the end after the programs have built, and that might just be like run a benchmark, which is in the Rust code, and then like, plot it using the C code or something like that, right? So for me, make is sort of the glue at the top that I might write. Um, usually, if your make file gets very large, there's a better tool. Um, what you'll find at, at like big companies, for example, is they often have one build system that manages all of their software. Um, so if you look at Google, for example, they have this open source system called Bazel. Um, and I don't think Google literally uses Bazel inside of Google, um, but it's sort of based on what they use internally, and it really just is intended to manage the entire build of everything Google has. Um, and Bazel in particular is built to be, I think they call it like a polyglot build framework. So the idea is that it works for many different languages. There's like an implement, there's a module for Bazel for this language and that language and that language, but they all integrate with the same Bazel framework, which then knows how to integrate um, dependencies between different libraries and different languages. Do you have a question? Yeah, can you go back 
Uh, sure. So when you say expressions, you mean the things in this file? Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, so these are. Uh, so make files are their own language. Um, they are, it's a pretty weird language. Uh, like it has a lot of weird exceptions. In many ways it's weird, just like bash is weird, but in different ways, which is even worse. Like when you're writing a make file, you sort of, you can sort of think like you're writing bash, but you're not because it's broken in different ways. Um, but, but it is its own language. Uh, and the way that make files are generally structured um, is that you have a sequence of, I think they call them directives. Uh, so every, like the, this thing, oops, uh, this thing is a directive and this is a directive. And every directive has a colon somewhere and everything to the left of the colon is a target and everything to the right of the colon, I guess, right of the colon um, is a dependency. Uh, and then all of the lines below that line are the sequence of operations known as the rules for once you have the dependencies, how do you build these targets? Uh, notice that make is very particular that you must use a tab to indent the rules. If you do not, make will not work. And they must be tabs. They cannot be four or eight spaces, it must be tabs. Um, and like you can have multiple operations here, right? Like I can do heck go hello or whatever. And then it would first run this and then run this. Um, there's, a, there's an exercise uh, for today's lecture that has you try to extend this makefile with a couple of other uh, targets that you might find interesting, that goes into a little bit more detail. Um, there's also some ability to execute external commands to like determine what the dependencies might be if your dependencies are not like a static list of files, but it's a little limited. Usually, once you start needing that sort of stuff, you might want to move to a, a more advanced build system. Yeah? What do you have two dependencies, and both of them depend on a common library, but they have completely major versions? Um, yeah, so the, the question is, what happens if I have, um, let's say that I have library A and library B. And they both depend on library C. Uh, but library A depends on like 4.0.1, and library B depends on 3.4.7. So they both depend on C, and so ideally we'd like to reuse C, but they depend on different major versions of C. What do we do? Um, what happens in this case depends entirely on the system that you're using, the language that you're using. Um, in some cases, the tool will just be like, well, I'll just pick four, which sort of implies that they're not really using semantic versioning. Um, in some cases, the tool will say, this is not possible. Like, if you do this, it's an error, and the tool will tell you, you either need to upgrade B, like have B use a newer version of, a, of C, or you need to downgrade A. You do not get to do this, and compilation will fail. Um, some tools are going to build two versions of C, um, and then like when it builds A, it will use the major four version of C, um, and when it builds B, it will use the major three version of C. One thing you end up with is really weird conditions here where like if C has dependencies, then now you have to build all of C's dependencies twice too, one for three and one for four. And maybe they share and maybe they don't. You can end up in particularly weird situations. If, imagine that um, the library C, like, uh, imagine that uh, library C like writes to a file, like writes to some like file on disk, some cache stuff. If you run your application now and like A does something to, call like c.save and b does something like c.load, then suddenly your, your application at the bottom is not going to work because the format is different, right? So these situations are often very problematic and, and most tools that support semantic versioning will reject this kind of configuration for exactly that reason. But it's so easy to shoot yourself in the foot. All right, uh, we will see you again tomorrow for security. Um, keep in mind, again, if you haven't done the survey, uh, the question I care the most about in the survey is what you would like us to cover in the last two lectures.
So the last two lectures are for you to choose what you want us to talk about and to give any questions that you want us to answer. So please like add that if you can. Um, and that's it. See you tomorrow.